name it. You know, as all of you know, the internet has been, you know, I think indisputably a, a sort of extraordinary tool for good in the world. It's been a platform and a driver of amazing innovation, entrepreneurship in technology, hardware, software, speech, government, uh, commerce, you name it. Uh, it's been a powerful tool for democracy, for civic engagement, for social movements, for activism around the world. Uh, it's really democratized the creation and the distribution of information, sort of put that power in the hands of individuals, made all of us very powerful and effective creators, authors, publishers, in a way that just wasn't possible before. But, like all technologies, like most things, it's a double-edged sword, right? There's a large and a very scary, very ugly dark side to the internet. Uh, and that ranges from the kinds of things we usually think of as cybercrime, right? So hacking, theft of 130 million credit card numbers, um, uh, drug and human trafficking, viruses, computer sabotage, corporate espionage, all the way up to cyber uh, terrorism and government sponsored uh, cyber attacks and government surveillance, as we certainly have heard a lot about lately. Um, but also to more personal crimes and torts from things like you know, really vicious trolling to harassment, stalking, cyberbullying, defamation, various invasions of privacy. Um, part of the democratizing of the production and distribution of information is we've made it really easy for anybody, anywhere, to create or take very nasty stuff about someone and then distribute it widely. Again, in a way that just wasn't possible before we had this massive network. Um, so we're gonna focus uh, today on the tension that exists between the good and the bad, right? How do we think about uh, particular, we're gonna take a couple of fairly specific slices of this bad, scary stuff, and think about how do you think about ways to control, to regulate, to remedy, to provide recourse for victims of those things without chilling or limiting the good that comes along with it? How do you try to balance those two? And the slices that we're gonna focus on primarily are so-called revenge porn and uh, mugshot sites. But from those, I think we'll extract and, and abstract up some broader lessons about how we think about regulating bad stuff on the internet while still trying to preserve as much of the good stuff uh, as we can. So can't have a better panel, can't imagine a better panel to talk about uh, these sorts of things. Let me introduce them quickly, even though their bios are in the in the program, I think it's useful just to hear who they are because they're so, I think, well suited to talk about exactly the sorts of things we're, we're uh, going to talk about today. So just working from left, my left to far left, uh, immediate left, Eric Goldman, many of you know, professor of law at Santa Clara Law School, director of Santa Clara's High Tech Law Institute. Uh, before Eric started teaching, he had a great career in private practice, was a transactional attorney at Cooley, and then had the distinction of being general counsel at epinions.com, may it rest in peace, um, for its recent disappearance. Uh, Eric's an expert in internet law, intellectual property, and advertising and marketing law, and he's hands down the country's leading expert on Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which, as you'll hear a lot in our panel, is the safe harbor that's given to a lot of intermediaries for a bunch of bad stuff their users might uh, do. Eric also is one of the best known legal bloggers. He has a blog called the Technology and Marketing Blog, um, which is really an absolute must read for anybody in this area, and particularly focusing on Section 230, although much more uh, broadly uh, than that as well. But Eric's left, Erica Johnstone, who's at Ritter, Costa, and Johnstone in San Francisco. She and her firm, I think, specialize in defending people who have been harmed online exactly the victims of exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about today. That includes defamation, harassment, invasion of the right to privacy, identity theft, uh, and impersonation. Uh, she's also a co-founder along with Colette Vogel, who some of you here know, uh, of an organization and a website called Without Our Consent, which is a project that is dedicated to, to trying to educate individuals who are harmed by stuff about them online 
and also trying to empower people, give them the tools to fight back against those sorts of things. Um, finally, far in, Mark Randaza, who battled flu and other difficulties to be here with us today. We really appreciate that. Mark is a prominent and, and highly visible First Amendment lawyer, uh, managing partner at the Rondaza Legal Group. He's self-described, but also described by many others as a First Amendment badass, which if you know anything about him, fits very well. Mark's cases also take him to the heart, often take him to the heart of the kind of issues that we're going to talk about today, the, the intersection, or more often the collision, between First Amendment interests and values and the internet, intellectual property law, uh, entertainment law. Uh, Mark also writes a very well-known legal blog, The Legal Satyricon, uh, uh, which is not only also extremely valuable for keeping up with the law and developments and cases in this area, uh, but is also extremely entertaining and fun to read. It, too, is self-described as occasionally irreverent. Uh, if you read it, I think you'd probably say it's more likely, you know, often delightfully outrageous uh, and extreme in the best possible ways. Uh, and as I expect you'll see today, Mark is one of the most sort of colorful and passionate advocates for uh, free speech online, First Amendment, and yet proper restrictions in the appropriate context. So that said, couldn't be happier with the panel, have such a great group to talk about the, the things we're going to talk about today. Let's start by talking about revenge porn and maybe just to, and this is going to be totally conversational, so we'll have a lot of back and forth and hopefully a lot of back and forth with you at the end in the form of questions. But maybe just to kick it off, Erica, could you just say a little bit about what, and, and I'd say revenge porn is an incredibly bad name for a, a really unfortunate phenomenon. I wish we had a better name for it. I but, do. Oh, good. Okay. So so give us your better name and just, just let's sort of set the stage by talking about what it is. Um, well, thank you for the invitation to be here today. I'm grateful to be able to speak with you and my fellow panelists about this issue. I think there's a lot of stuff that we can agree on. One is our commitment to free speech and um, free discourse and creative expression and self-actualization and truth and political speech as values that we are all committed to. I think we can also agree that revenge porn is evil. What we disagree on is what we should then do about that. Um, so what I want to say is, um, you know, the internet is amazing. I think the Pope said it was a gift from God, and it is that amazing, right? But it's also run by humans, and humans can be very evil to each other. And so part of the law in protecting those ideals that we cherish is that the law might have a place in protecting people so that we're not valuing the speech of abusers 100%, but we're actually creating an environment that looks more like the America we believe we are rather than some repressive regime. So what I want to do is talk about what is revenge porn, because I think it helps to humanize the issue rather than talk about it as an abstract. And so this is how it works. The first thing the perpetrator does is obtain intimate images of a victim, of the victim in the victim's most private moments. And there's a couple ways to do that. It can be the nightmare X scenario, where you have, um, where you created sexual content within the privacy of a relationship for his or her eyes only. You break up. One person hates the other, and in fact, hates that person so much that he's going to rob her of her sexual autonomy and force her into the non-consensual porn trade. The next is where consent cannot be given, because we see this with um, underage uh, sexting, where they cannot consent, and also sexual abuse and intoxication. An example of this is the Rita Parsons, where she was sexually assaulted at a teen party. The assault was documented, photographed, and then not only is the original assault so traumatic, but then every image that is then circulated thereafter you can never take down. And it's this relentless hounding of this the most terrible and humiliating moment of your life that then defines you. And she um, committed suicide. There's also Peeping Tom, which some of you may remember the Tyler Clementi story, <coughs> where Tyler and his roommate, Darun Ravi, were freshmen at Rutgers, and Tyler had... Um, an encounter with another man. Darun wanted to be a big man on campus, and so he filmed this and then live streamed it over Twitter and created this party to out his roommate. Tyler also committed suicide. Then there's hacking, which we've seen with Miss Teen USA, where someone will take over your webcam and take photos and videos of you in your most private moments, and you don't even know that you're being watched. So there's a lot of ways 
that intimate content is created, which is why revenge porn is a misnomer, because it's not always about some nightmare ex. Um, a lot of times, it's consent, it's peeping toms, it's hacking. There is an industry that is based on um, human misery of this kind. So then what happens is the perpetrator hides behind the anonymity of the internet. There are 40 sites that are fully or partially devoted to revenge porn, and there are 800 porn sites that are known to host revenge porn. These numbers are from DMCA Defender. So the perpetrator will go online and create <coughs> profiles in the victim's name using his or her identification and then upload that intimate content. Then the operators of the revenge porn websites will develop, solicit, advertise, and profit from the revenge porn and then claim Section 230 immunity, which is kind of a gray area that's being litigated right now, is whether they are actually covered by Section 230 because there's an argument that they are responsible for the creation or development of what is unlawful about their site. And then the search engines crawl the websites and create an index so that when you Google the victim's name, you get endless pages of non-consensual porn search results, so it goes viral. Um, and they are most likely immune from liability because they cannot be held sp responsible for speech by third parties. So what you have at the end of the day is a site like now defunct as anyone up that got 300,000 to 350,000 views a day. That is four to five Super Bowl stadiums full of strangers jeering at a naked, humiliated victim for sexual entertainment and sport, which is why some advocates of revenge porn see this in a class like rape and domestic violence and sexual harassment, um, that it violates our commitment to equality. Um, so that's what, that's what I say. When we talk about revenge porn, that's the scenario. The Super Bowl, naked, humiliated victim, jeering for sport is what, what it looks like in reality. Uh, Erica, you promised us an alternative term. Non-consensual porn. I think that's helpful, actually. I, I prefer that term myself um, because uh, the revenge aspect is really only one scenario, and there's such a wide range of alternative scenarios, um, each of which may have the same consequence for the victim. Um, so, you know, was the uh, depiction created with consent, or uh, um, you know, and there's a wide range of scenarios where it isn't, where it's a surreptitious video, for example. I think you may have implied that in one of yours. Um, uh, or it's the remote webcam that's turned on. Um, and then was it disseminated or shared with consent? Um, uh, and then uh, what was the expectation of that sharing? Um, so it could be it was shared with the expectation it would go to one person, one person only, but then that uh, expectation is vitiated. Um, and so, you know, all the, the consent pieces are at multiple stages of the distribution from creation to distribution. And um, the focus on the revenge piece, I think, actually really uh, stylizes it too much. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. And, it, you know, even, revenge almost has this implication, maybe just to me because I'm Sicilian, but as a positive thing. Uh, that, <laughs> uh, Don't cross Mark. That they must have done something. You know, it, it almost starts the conversation with she or he did something to get here, uh, whether it's actionable or not. And so far, uh, I've only found one victim who did. I mean, I had, I've gotten calls from lots of people who've done this, but the, the one, that, one that really sticks out that I can tell and we can laugh about was a, a woman, there was a whole series of pictures of her um, doing really unspeakable things with a uh, gas pump. Just leave it at that, Eric. That, stay confused. <clears throat> I've um, seen a lot of bad things, so this will just yeah, go Yeah, the that things category. I can't unsee, I really, I'm gonna need a hug. But um, <clears throat> she's, uh, you know, this is on a highway, out in the middle of, you know, anybody could have driven by and, uh, you know, a whole series of pictures of her being very creative with uh, a refueling station. I, I had to tell her, what do you want me to do? I mean, you were doing this in plain view out in, out in the wide open. Uh, I can't really see myself walking out of a courtroom with any credibility if I argued that your right to privacy was violated here. <laughs> um, but that's one, all right? And that, and that is the one, one outlier. You know, the rest of them are someone lost their phone and you know, didn't have adequate security on it and didn't do the you know, wipe your iPhone as soon as they realize it's gone. Or yeah, it's, a, it, it's, some, or, or it's just somebody who's, there's nothing really to take revenge for 
yeah, she broke up with you. Get over it, pal. I mean, you know, if every girl I've ever broken up with, first thing I do is delete the naked pictures of her because it's just uh, the right thing to do. Um, I think, and I, and I want to live in a world where women want to give us naked pictures of themselves, and that world is furthered by gentlemen by us deleting them when we break up with them. I know this goes for women too, but I can't speak to the female experience because I'm not uh, female. I do think it's helpful though to um, focus, uh, if you want, on a paradigmatic example where the um, uh, the recordings or photos are uh, taken surreptitiously. So there wasn't even the disclosure that they were being taken place. And that I think it's <laughs> over the hump that you might have uh, that the victim might have been able to control the circumstance at all. Uh, let's just start with the premise that the victim didn't have that control because it was surreptitiously created. But, you know, so there, there's one. You, but even then, I mean, I think. I mean, I disagree because I think they should be on the same level. I mean, every, everybody's got a right to take naked pictures of themselves and give them to somebody with that some level. Of I wasn't trying to cast this, uh, a dispersions on uh, the person who uh, does. I'm simply trying to say, if you want one paradigm, it's yeah. helpful to have a paradigm so that, that you eliminate that one variable that you might then, uh, if anyone has any doubts about that, let's not go there. Let's simply focus on a circumstance where it was non-consensual in every respect. I just want to be very sensitive to the, the person who takes them consensually just because they consented the photo being taken, that consent ends at that point, in, I think, in all three of our eyes. Yeah. All four of us. Yeah. Thank you. So, so there's one other element of a lot of these situations we haven't touched on yet. So we've talked about the, the victim and then the person who actually you know, either has the pictures because he or she sent them to them uh, and uploads them or hacks and get them, so we, gets them. We've talked about the site that hosts them, you know, maybe in a very very deliberately you know, reaching out all about those kinds of pictures, maybe less so. Uh, but there's another element to, to a lot of these cases that would be useful for you to talk about, which is then the demand for money to take them down. Can you say a little bit about those? It doesn't happen in every case, but some of the instances have had this extra element of, oh, you want to get rid of these pictures? Well, we can help you with that. Right. So there's a big industry that profits from human misery and humiliation. Um, and we see this with both mugshots and revenge porn where um, this content is uploaded to this website that's called you know, my ex or mugshots.com. And then the flip side of that is that you can then pay $500 to remove that content. And, and so there's a question about whether that's really extortion because they've already posted it. And normally extortion is I won't post it if you do something. So that's kind of a legal issue that's being worked out. Um, and I think that there's some moral culpability with extortion, but as a practical matter, I would much rather deal with a site that extorts than one that doesn't because it is a practical solution to getting the content down. If I can tell my client for $500 you can make this go away, that is an excellent solution. Sites that don't take it down, there's no hope. So Mark, you recently won a lot of money for a victim in one case that involved extortion or at least these kinds of things. You want to say a little yeah, bit? Yeah, drinks are on me with all of it. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> well, I, we got an award, but right. that's, I, I don't want to BS anybody and think we collected it. But you know, we've had some good success against a number of these sites. I mean, we originally, the, the original is anyone up, uh, we took down uh, in a rather unorthodox way. I, I represent a client that, um, that was very outraged at this and had a lot of money and didn't mind spending it uh, just as a kind of white knight thing. And I said, all right, well, we'll you know, let's put, uh, you know, 50, 60 grand in the trust account, and we'll go after this guy. And we wound up just buying the site from him for 10,000 uh, bucks, which was a pretty good deal. And then he shut it down immediately. And that was his anyone up. And he's, of course, got some problems now because uh, he's been taken to, taken to task by the authorities. Uh, immediately thereafter, a bunch of sites sprung up to be just like it, including Is Anybody Down? Um, which th this was the first one to do this monetization. Uh, and it was pretty creative because it had a, an ad on it for an attorney, David Blade the Third, um, who was also known as the takedown lawyer. And a, cl a potential client came to me and said, is this guy for real? I said, well, the only David Blade I can find licensed in the United States was like 750,000 years old and lived in Florida, which the two were mutually necessary, right? right. So <laughs> I contacted him, and he didn't really know what the internet was and didn't know what I was talking about. And I said, OK, I'm sorry to have troubled you. <clears throat> so we, we harassed him out of existence, pretty much. And then uh, you got posted, got the same thing going on. And that's who we've gotten our judgment against. 
Now, You Got Posted had a couple of underage victims on the site, which makes things a lot easier uh, because there are statutory damages for underage pornography publication thereof. My first involuntary porn case was, uh, was against a, a number of porn companies that had taken a picture of a girl who was uh, 17 at the time the photos were taken and was using them in their ad campaigns. So uh, you know, not only was she being distributed on these websites, but she was the, uh, the face of, uh, of a number of their ad campaigns. And probably bad phrasing given the uh, content, but uh, so <clears throat> can I answer your question? I'm on painkillers mm -hmm. yep. right now. Yep. So. Can, can I say a little yeah, more yeah, about that? Because I think that, um, I like the way that you phrased it, that in the past extortion used to be pay me to keep quiet. And right. here um, we've seen a shift in the dynamics because of the fact that um, uh, it is possible to provide heightened visibility for content and to then de-emphasize that content uh, by taking affirmative steps. Um, so much of that is driven by search engines, and in particular Google. Um, so we're in a different phenomenon now where um, the real game involves, um, uh, in many cases, getting content well indexed in the search engines, and that has commercial value. Um, either it's commercial value because uh, you're able to sell to the people who come to the site, or in this, this case, you can sell by saying, I will, I will turn the spotlight off. It is possible that we have similar problems in sites that are not indexed in the search engines, but usually those uh, problems are, are uh, much less. Um, if a site uh, were to uh, exist uh, without any search engine indexing and then uh, publish uh, a non-consensual pornography, for example, that would still cause some significant harm. But usually, the real harm comes the moment that the search engines uh, are uh, triggered. And so um, understanding the role of the search engines and the process of enabling this particular business model, I think, is helpful for us having conversations about different options to solve it. Yeah, so that, go ahead. I was just going to follow up. I completely agree. And um, one area where we have very fruitful conversations is by bringing in the intermediaries and the search engines and talking about ways that they can voluntarily and we can work together and be on the same page to address some of these issues. So one of the things that Google did with mugshots was that it downgraded. It found this conduct morally reprehensible, especially when it was extortionate. And so Google controls the volume, right? It can turn the volume up on speech or down. There's only 30 odd things that will be on the first page of search results, and Google decides what it is. And so as a policy, I said, you know what? We don't like these websites. We don't think these results are accurate or that it's a good user experience. So we're going to turn the volume down and drive them off the first page, which is fantastic. Google doesn't have to do that, but voluntarily it did. And when I say Google, I'm also talking about Bing and Yahoo, too. Um, though I don't know their policy on mugshots. Um, so, you know, you can make the case that revenge porn is very similar to mugshot in this whole industry built on human misery that is not actually benefiting the users um, who are seeking to find accurate information on Google, and that for the same reason you could turn the volume down on revenge porn and push it off um, the first couple pages with search. And that would be very helpful to a lot of people. So let's, let's stay with that, but before we do, let me just kind of frame it so you've got a sense of the, the pieces. So in thinking about what could we, what should we do about this problem, there are at least four different approaches, right? One is private civil suits of the kind that, that Mark was talking about and has brought against maybe the perpetrator, the person who actually posts the images, and secondarily against the site, and we can come back and talk about that. Uh, another one is action either you know, trying to bring suits against intermediaries like Google or the sites themselves, or more voluntary action like the kind you're, you're talking about now. And let's, let's come back to that in just a second. Uh, the third is criminal liability. Right? So we've seen this in a few cases now. We can talk about those where the authorities actually prosecute either or both the person who uploaded and posted the images or maybe the site that's hosting them. Um, and there are both some cases and some proposed legislation. Uh, and then finally, more creative ways to try to take the content down, particularly trying to use copyright uh, as, a, as a way to effectuate takedowns. So we've got at least four different ways <coughs> trying to use the position and, and the ability of intermediaries is one of those. So just so we're all clear, why is it you talk about this as sort of a voluntary thing for Google to do? 
why couldn't you force, leave copyright out for a minute, why can't we force Google to do this? Why can't we say, look, you're hosting, I mean, you're pointing to, you as a search engine are, are directing people to this bad, potentially illegal conduct. I'm going to sue you for that. Eric, do you want to talk about sort of Eric's. Section 230? <laughs> Heart and soul of Eric's work. Um, it's good to get out on the table. Well, I mean, I think it's really helpful. Um, so let's start with the idea that there is a bad actor. Um, and we're going to start with them as the, the foundation for the rest of the discussion. And then we're going to layer on the potential other bad actors. And especially when we talk about criminal law, we are talking about these people have engaged in such bad actions that we're going to punish them by criminal sanctions. Um, but even civil sanctions could be significant and are a vote about what our society tolerates. So we're now going to start with the premise, there's a bad actor. And for now, I'm going to call that person the uploader, the person who uploads content that is uh, non-consensual pornography. But it could be, in fact, any of the other things we're talking about. We might say the bad actor is the person who uploads the mugshot site, uh, site under the particular regime that they have. Or uh, we could talk about the person who uploads a defamatory uh, uh, review to rip off report. In my mind, the answers would be potentially the same for all of these categories of content. Um, the, the question we have is, who else should we uh, be liable? And the way that I tell my students is think like a plaintiff. Once you find one bad actor, congratulations. Keep going. <laughs> and keep finding as many people as you can squeeze to make you do what you want them to do. Now, when we start talking those terms, when we're talking about uh, content being published online, I hope you're starting to say, hmm, wait a minute. I'm not sure I really want us to start thinking about who else can we squeeze? Who else can we put under our thumb because of the legal rights that have been created, usually either under this category that they're criminal sanctions, that we want to throw these people in jail or otherwise subject them to the social appropriation of having done something so wrong, or <coughs> civil liability, we want to put these people and take cash out of their pocket and put it in ours. Um, and so we need to be thoughtful about when we build these layers, these stacks of liability, who, how, how far are we going to take that? Um, in the copyright context, if you remember the debates over SOPA and PIPA, for example, there was debates about we want to take it not only to the person who uploads copyright infringement material, we want to take it to their service provider and the pro service providers to their service provider. And the way I talked about it to my students, is I said, Ultimately, you are responsible for copyright infringement of everyone else in the world because you have some financial web of connection to every other person in society. And if we're going to follow the money or go up the chain, in the end, where do we stop? So let's start with the, the upload of um, mugshots, uh, 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 non-consensual pornography, defamatory reviews on ripoff report. Um, there's a site that hosts that content. These are people who created a technology platform that allows the uploader to reach a broader audience. Um, then we could say there's the people who might be the hosts of the hosts. These might be the people who provide back-end services uh, to the person who hosts that. There might be the money, people who move the money, who provide the financial service processing um, uh, that allows uh, the uh, person to monetize, whether it's the uploader, the web host, the web host host, um, that's the money provider. And then you can go up for the stream. There's the power <coughs> company, there's the telecommunication services, the internet access, there's the landlord. Who are, of all these people are we going to put on the stack? Congress in 1996 actually answered this question really cleanly. They said, um, and I'm going to summarize in my words, um, they said um, that if you have a bad actor um, that is uh, uh, publishing content online, no one else is responsible for it. It's actually really clean. We don't build this stack of liability and work all the way up the chain. We don't ever ask that question at all. We find the bad actor who is the one who is the, uh, responsible for originating that content, and then we say they are accountable, nobody else is. And with that kind of model, it's proven to be a nice bright line rule. You're familiar with the, the um, policy discussions about rules versus standards and the benefits of each. Here we have a bright line rule. Who else is responsible beyond the uploader? The answer should be under Section 230, no one. Um, and then we start to see uh, whether we actually like that policy, whether we think that's a good policy. Does Google need to cut off the mugshot sites or the revenge porn sites or the, the, the ripoff report? The Section 230 says they're not responsible, period. We just end the story right there. Um, then we say, will they? does that mean that they will do nothing? We already heard. The answer is yes, they will do things, even though they're not legally compelled to do so. They have other incentives beyond the simple mitigation of legal uh, obligations in order to intervene when they think appropriate. Um, so uh, the Section 230 has uh, uh, created, shifted the discussion from 
uh, search engines, web hosts, internet access providers, and all the other service providers to the bad actor from thinking about what must they do because they might be thrown in jail or because they might be writing a large check to a plaintiff into what do I need to do in order to, um, uh, to run my business appropriately as I see it. Um, there are three exceptions to uh, Section 230's uh, otherwise bright line rule. Um, we're going to ignore one of them, although it could come up. The Electronic Communications Privacy Act, we heard some discussion about that. Uh, if you understood it uh, uh, from that discussion, kudos to you. I've said it for years. I don't understand it. And I don't know how it applies in this context. Uh, we don't really have good paradigmatic cases. Um, the other two are more relevant. Um, Section 230 does not preempt um, uh, federal criminal prosecutions. And it does not preempt uh, intellectual property claims. And I think we'll talk about the nuances on the latter shortly. Um, so if you're wondering why uh, uh, copyright takedown notices work, they work because Congress said copyright law is not covered by Section 230 and its bright line rule. It's actually covered by another statutory scheme, 17 U.S.C. 512, the Online Safe Harbors of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, so uh, copyright is in its own bucket. Uh, federal crimes are in its own bucket. And there might be some other things in those buckets. Otherwise, the answer is we find the bad actor, and then we stop the liability there. So while we're on 512, let's, let's tease out one other notion. So the, the bright line you describe Congress drawing is, look, if someone else is the creator and publisher of this content, then they're liable and no one else is. The host, you know, whoever they send it to and host it with is not liable. Uh, in a very small handful of cases, intermediaries have lost that protection. Right? There are, at least in theory, things that an intermediary could do to sort of lose the protection that might be relevant in some of these non-consensual porn cases. You um, the, the talk about that and how limited that is. Yeah, I mean, there really are very <laughs> limited exceptions where it was a what I call paradigmatic Section 230 case, where the defendant um, was uh, a service provider to a publisher of content. Um, one of the classic reasons why Section 230 is denied is because the um, a defendant argues that uh, they should be immunized for their own, their own words that they chose. Um, and uh, that just isn't what Section 230 was designed to cover. If they originate the content, they should be responsible. We have some gray areas around how websites market themselves. So if a website adopts a marketing language that is then rendered inconsistent by what users are doing, there are a number of cases that Section 230 applies. But there's some other situations where Section 230 might not. So for example, in FTC land, the FTC simply lives in a world where Section 230 doesn't exist um, because they say, you marketed uh, your site in the following way. That deceived consumers. I don't care what happened about your relationship with your users. Um, and, uh, and then beyond that, the flagship example of or exception to Section 230 is a case that came out in 2008 from the Ninth Circuit called the Roommates.com case. Um, and the Roommates.com case is confusing because it was, it was defectively drafted. It had two separate holdings, and those two holdings lead to inconsistent results. Um, and so when lower courts or other courts are trying to interpret the Roommates.com uh, uh, opinion. They have two different holdings they can choose from. They can choose from holding A or holding B. Um, holding A is incredibly narrow. It says that unless a website um, uh, uh, designed, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, unless a website, um, uh, 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 tell me, I didn't um, prepare this uh, note. Um, uh, it required the input of legal content. Um, uh, or encourage the illegal content uh, through some specific things that they did, um, they would not be liable uh, for that. Um, most courts, oh, about three quarters of the opinions that have cited roommates to come have said that's the only basis on which uh, there's an exclusion from uh, the uh, Section 230. So about three quarters of the citations to roommate.com is for the defense. It actually is, this was a narrowing of any exclusions. Um, the other holding says if you could argue that the defendant at all was responsible for any piece of developing or creating the content, um, and developing has to mean something other than creation. So it has to mean some other editorial role than simply being the author or originator of the content, um, then you're responsible for that. And that is the minority of opinions uh, that have cited uh, roommates.com. In fact, many of those have other affectations I think make them less credible. Um, 
so uh, the, you know, the flagship case that has been the other exclusion, how can I get around roommates, uh, uh, the Section 230 immunity, is actually, in the vast majority of cases, proven to be a boon for the defense. So in this context, the argument would be, and Erica, I'm curious whether you've you've made this argument or at least thought about how you could, for a site, a sort of revenge porn site that is essentially all about that, that basically you know, does everything to encourage people to you know, <coughs> upload things that they know they shouldn't, upload things that were shared in an intimate setting, you know, just is, is all about in language and purpose and everything else, really encouraging people to do it. You could make an argument, though probably not winning in most courts, that that's going far enough into creating or developing content. You know, some of the cases are easier where you know, it looks like an independent site, but in the case of Is Anyone Up, I think part of what was going on there was the, create, the owner of the site was in fact posting some of the things himself and, and paying someone to hack into people's computers to steal intimate photos and then post them. So that's easy, right? And then you're no longer the intermediary. Then some you are the some were paying a bounty for they'd get a picture and then they'd publish it and say, if anybody knows who she is or he is, uh, you know, any personal information you have about them, they would pay for that. That clearly jumps outside of Section 230, would you? Agree? I'm sorry, I, I just um, uh, was facing, uh, paying for content does not uh, it preclude Section 230 immunity for the content <coughs> that was acquired. And we have a pretty good line, list of cases that have concluded that. I would have thought so, but I'm... I got the guru here. I want to make sure that he agrees that was with actually, me. That was actually an early case. That goes back to the Blumenthal versus Drudge case from 1998. So we have a, a history of over 15 years of cases saying that. I like it when the oracle thinks I'm right. Yeah, one might be able to fashion a new argument that if you're paying for, you know, very explicitly for illegal content, and you know, here's a bounty for uploading images that you know the, the person has not authorized and don't want to, could at least argue that goes beyond. I don't know if that's and very that, today. Yeah, and we have an example about that. That was the AccuSearch case uh, that came mm -hmm. out from uh, the 10th Circuit where um, it was this resale of pretexted phone records online. So uh, someone say, I want to go and get uh, phone records of somebody, um, and uh, they would um, pay an intermediary who would then pay somebody to go out and actually pretext the telephone company and say, I need my phone records. Even though it wasn't really me. And uh, the uh, Tenth Circuit said um, that the retailer in that chain couldn't uh, claim Section 230 for having resold the report. So in that case, there was actually a payment mechanism here um, where they were paying for these pretexted phone records, but it didn't help or was not covered by Section 230. Um, I think that case would remain controversial. It was predicated on the minority ruling of roommates.com. So there's a bunch of cases that have simply since then have suggested that they don't read roommates.com the same way that the Tenth Circuit did. So on the civil side, when I get a case and I'm looking for those um, defendants, uh, the case against the perpetrator is a no-brainer. We have an endless number of laws that have been broken in revenge porn that we can use in a complaint. That's not the problem. It's that litigation is very expensive and the defendants have no assets. Then I think about what about the website. And where Eric saw two buckets or two holes in uh, Section 230, in my mind, I have three holes. I have the one that is um, intellectual property, federal criminal law, and then I would also say that contents that are websites that are responsible in whole or in part for the creation or development of the content. And in my mind, revenge porn sites fall within that category, and you can make very strong arguments that they are not protected by Section 230. But at the end of the day, this is illusory because I don't have clients who can afford $100,000 to sue a revenge porn website for a judgment that he or she will never collect. So unless you have an attorney like Mark, who spends hundreds of free hours a year doing this for people, and he's the only attorney in the country I know who does this, then this is all an academic point. So let's go back to what started us on the, the 230 uh, detour, which is an important one because it, it sort of is the foundation for a lot of what we'll talk about. But let's go back to the role of search engines and Google and so on. You described <coughs> something Google has voluntarily done, right? Couldn't be forced to do this, but voluntarily sort of pushed down the ranking of mugshot websites. And we'll maybe talk about those near the end. Those are sites doing the same kind of thing. They essentially buy mugshots from police departments, public agencies post them online, link to the person's picture, and then when someone Googles their name, what do they see? One of the hot top images is a mugshot and details of their arrest. And what do you know? There's a service where they can pay 
certain amount of money to make these things go away. So uh, Google is, is dealing with that, lowering those in search results, but they're not doing it for revenge porn sites? Not to my knowledge. Um, I'm not sure what their internal discussion is about that. I think there's some interest, but I haven't seen it in practice because I know that if you're posted on my X, it's still the first thing that shows up right now on search. So I'm curious what all of you think about sort of this kind of private, and we can start in this context and maybe broaden it, but I mean, this is essentially really private regulation or private enforcement, right? This is acting, asking an extraordinarily powerful internet intermediary to take certain actions, which will affect the ability of people to post things online. Maybe it's a good thing, but it will certainly affect that ability. Um, how do we feel about them exercising that role in, in this context and then maybe more broadly? Um, I think we assume that Google is and other search engines are exercising the editorial discretion in deciding what search results that we see. That's why we use them, in fact, and why Google uh, leapfrogs so many of the other search engines. They did a better job at reading our minds and figuring out what we might want to find. Um, when it comes to some of the seedier sides of the internet, um, it is, I think, completely defensible for Google to decide that that's just not the kind of content they're going to be a uh, resource to cover. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, we uh, rely upon them to screen out certain aspects of um, the internet. So for example, as you may know, they have a malware warning um, that they have uh, sites that they include in their index, but they say, by clicking on this link, you have the risk of being exposed to malware. Do you really want to go there? Uh, we, we trust that Google will be looking out for our interests accordingly. Um, from my perspective, I think that Google's uh, algorithm um, should try to be a measure of the credibility of a site. Is this a site that's credible? And the uh, position I have is that um, when a site cha charges to remove for content, I find that site simply not credible. Um, their business model is totally misaligned with providing good, useful content to the rest of society. And so I keep hoping that Google will uh, uh, come up with a algorithm that reflects that particular aspect of the business model. It's not credible to me. And that would cover not only the mugshot sites, it would cover some of the uh, uh, non-consensual porn sites, and it would also cover the review sites that are in the business of saying, we want negative reviews because our goal is to get them as high as possible into the search engines, and then uh, ask that business to come and pay us to try and mitigate the consequences of that. Uh, in all cases, those uh, there's such a, an embedded conflict of interest in the sites themselves, I find them not credible contributors to our conversation. I mean, it's accurate, but the, you know, the thing is, <clears throat> when we ask, you know, Google has decided that mugshot sites are not the thing. And frankly, I, I don't, I mean, I don't want to stick up for mugshot sites, but I often find myself sticking up for things that are unpopular. I mean, that's at least a public record. It did something to get there. Um, you know, I'm, I actually know their general counsel, and he and I were laughing about it. It's inevitable I'm going to wind up on there for something. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Mark, you are not already there? That's, that's, wow, that's incredible. Yeah, I have managed to keep the mugshot camera I, off of me. Just so to be far. clear, the, the mugshot sites uh, will publish the photos and, and include the names of people who have been arrested. So what have they done uh, to be indexed? Um, it's they've been arrested. Remember, there's a big difference between being arrested and being convicted. We're all told that whenever we see these TV shows that says these people are innocent until found guilty. So the mugshot sites are actually trading it with a bunch of people who actually have done nothing wrong except be the victim of a prosecutorial mistake. And, and some of them are hilarious. I mean, you know, gold paint guy? I mean, where would the world be without gold paint guy? You know, this guy who's been arrested like 18 times for huffing gold spray paint and in all of his mugshots, he's got like this big gold thing around him and his crazy eyes. I mean, the world's a better place because we have gold paint guy, I think. Uh, at least it brings a little laughter to our lives. <clears throat> but you know, I think it's worth uh, looking at Eric's view of Section 230. And look, from my point of view, I make a lot of money on Section 230. I mean, tons of it. I drive a wicked nice car that I should call the Section 230. Um, and, and it makes the job really easy. I mean, it's like, it's like being in the house in Vegas. It's great. You know, I, I represent these sites. I get the crazy threatening, you know, we're going to ruin you. Uh, the letter, and then I just, you know, and I have a stack of different versions of my, you know, fuck you, section 230 letters. Um, you know, some of them are very That's respectful. Fuck you, comma, section 230, right? <laughs> no, no punctuation at all. Fuck you, section 230. 
I uh, accept an explanation. No, not even spaces uh, in the There's middle. an exclamation uh, mark at the end, though. I'm sure a few. Word. Maybe a little smiley. Emoticon. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that is often I can send a letter. You know, sometimes we send a nice letter saying, look, you know, we see where you're coming from. And, and sometimes I have a client says, oh, I feel bad for this person. Have them sign an affidavit that it isn't true, uh, you know, under penalty of perjury, and we'll take it down. And that always makes me feel nice and fuzzy inside. Um, because I got to do a good deed, but then sometimes I have the client says, "You're my lawyer. Do your job," and and I, you know, and I ruin these people, and uh, you know, and, and my paycheck is is laced with misery. But you know, not my problem. I have a daughter who has expensive tastes, so, and a <laughs> wife that's out of my league. I got to do what I got to do, guys. But <clears throat> even as somebody who is probably one of the prime financial beneficiaries of Section 230 in the country. Um, you know, I gotta say, it, it, it maybe there should be less than that one line where we have it. Perhaps you know, we, we tolerate that in the copyright context. We send a DMCA notice, you run this site, you are now on notice. Now you can say, we don't care, we're not taking it down, as Google did in the Garcia case, which don't get into too much, but you can say, that's all right, I'll stand in the shoes of the original person. And I have clients who choose to do that very frequently. They said, that, nope, this is fair use. We're not going to take it down. Go ahead and sue us if you want. And then, you know, hilarity ensues then. But <clears throat> why not have some kind of a standard where if you put this person on notice? Because the revenge porn sites so far, the one thing that has been their biggest problem is they've all been run by idiots. I can, I'm sure between the three of us, or even like a half of one of us drunk, we could tell you how to set up a perfect revenge porn site that would be completely protected by Section 230, and there's nothing anyone could ever do about it. So why not have you know, a, a modification to Section 230? Maybe the time has come where if you're put on notice that something is violating somebody else's rights, you have a choice. You can say, all right, we'll take it down. Or, or you can say, no, we, we think this belongs there. Uh, we will stand up for this stall in the marketplace of ideas. And we will accept responsibility for that. Now, would that mean that some sites would have a weak spine and others would have a stronger one? Uh, yeah, it would. Um, but would it not be, you know, at the end of the day, are we not better off uh, as a society? Because, look, back in the early days of the internet, it was hilarious. We had, you know, essentially a thing that a not very many people used, a lot of forward thinkers used, and a lot of weird people used, and forward thinkers and weird people put together is just a beautiful place, and it gives us, you know, Mr. Spock ate my balls as a website, and, and that's just a great thing. But, you know, now, I mean, I, I'm, maybe I'm a bit of a snob, because I look at the human condition, and I think it's an awful thing, um, but now those, you know, that bottom 10% of humanity can now afford a computer and an internet connection, and this is where we are. And maybe we need to recognize that perhaps complete democratization might require a little better liability scheme, and why not? Eric, no one better to <coughs> get the why not portion of the I know, he's going to kill me than, now. Than Watch. Yeah. I'm <laughs> Huge topic, <laughs> right? My Whether spanking. or not to change 230 and, and how and why. <coughs> Could easily take up way more time this whole section, but it's it's a really important piece of this, so I'd love to get into it for a bit. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a wide range of different legal standards we could apply. Once we get beyond the, the starting point, that we've got one defendant, one defendant only, and we could uh, look at uh, some kind of intent standard. We could look at knowledge standards. We could look at recklessness. We could look at negligence. We could use strict liability. We could say that there's going to be shifting burdens. Well, um, no duty until X condition occurs. And then at that point, um, uh, uh, we'll see, um, uh, then you'll have obligations. Um, or we'll uh, treat you as having different levels to enter. Um, and I think all of those should be our fair game for discussion. I don't think anything should be off the table of discussion. Um, having said that, we can point to some data that we have. And in particular, when we talk about what does the law look like 
when we say there's one defendant and one defendant only, versus what do we do when we have a notice-based liability scheme? Because that's the current model that we have today in, uh, with respect to copyright law on the one hand, which is a notice-based liability scheme, and um, uh, Section 230 protected uh, uh, claims where there is no notice based on liability. We already have an A-B test running today. And we know how that plays out in practice. When a copyright notice comes in, there's very few defendants, even those who might otherwise think that they have strong spines, who will say, I'm willing to take the legal risk accordingly. Let me stand up for my users. Um, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to fight back on this copyright notice. The standard response is, and this is uniform across the industry. This is not uh, big players versus small players, whatever. The uniform response is, down goes the content. Um, and so what happens in a notice-based liability scheme is the collateral damage from the errors of the notices, where notices are sent that are not truthful, when notices are sent on mistake, when notices are sent with bad intent. In all cases, the content that is targeted by the notice will come down. How do we know that? We've seen what happens in the copyright standpoint. Even when we have mistaken copyright notices, the content comes down. We try and sort it out after that. So why not have this? Because if we like the internet um, as you know, providing all these social goods, we have to think about which of those social goods will not be provided. And um, I'm going to be following a brief in the Google versus Garcia case um, where um, we talk about uh, how the copyright slash Section 230 interface works, how copyright can undermine the goals of Section 230. And as part of that, I did uh, just a survey. I went to Alexa, the um, uh, the traffic measurement site, and I looked at the um, uh, the top sites. The top 12 sites in Alexa are all unambiguously based on third-party content. In other words, the top 12 sites that we use most frequently, the sites that we use on a regular day-to-day -day basis, they all rely upon Section 230 as a foundational principle. Will those sites change if we uh, eliminate Section 230? I don't know what they would look like in that world. Um, but uh, would they have existed without Section 230? I don't know. I doubt it. And will we see the replacements for those sites? The new sites that usurp them without Section 230, that's where we start to get, uh, should get very, very nervous. Will the new competitors that take over those top 12 sites emerge um, that, uh, without Section 230? I think we have some reasons to believe that they won't. So a couple of quick follow-ups on that. Let's, then let's go back to some other possible solutions to the, the non-consensual pornography issue overall. So some, when people are talking about possible Section 230 reform, possible limitations to avoid sort of a free pass to so much of the bad stuff that happens, one approach sometimes is to say, look, let's identify very narrow, very specific examples. So let's say we'll define revenge porn. We'll say that if you as a site get notice that you are hosting a particular piece of revenge porn, then you're in this notice and takedown situation. We won't do it for anything else. So all the other good stuff that's flourished on the internet as a result of uh, the protections of 230 can, can continue. And we'll just focus on, you know, in this case, revenge porn. Uh, in another case, maybe something else. What's wrong with I'm, with I'm not comfortable with that. Because then, then you're simply saying, because this is sexual content, there's this problem. I mean, you've got, you know, there's, there's a lot worse things to have published about you than, you know, these, these photos. I mean, uh, the one example that always haunts me is the, uh, anybody here familiar with the name Nikki Katsouris? Yeah, all right, somebody, yeah, that, by the expression on your face, you probably feel the same way. Uh, it's, uh, this was a, a girl who uh, crashed her father's Porsche uh, while she was, uh, had a significant amount of cocaine in her system. The photographs from the scene were absolutely gruesome. Uh, if you ever have an opportunity to see them, do not. Look at them. They they will make you cry or vomit. If they don't, you need to see a shrink. Um, <clears throat> and when these got out, people published them. Uh, not only do they publish them, but they publish them again and again and again, and sent them to her family and to her dad with messages saying, you know, hi, daddy, here I am. I mean, it was just I can't can't think of anything that I've ever seen that's more abusive than that. And so. You know, I, I don't want to see it tailored to just this because, you know, as somebody who sticks up for adult entertainment companies a lot, I believe sexual expression should not have a different standard. Um, I think what we, you know, we need to look at is, is the intermediary benefiting from the harm? 
And I think, and, and I don't think they should be on, you know, on the hook just because they are benefiting. I think there is some very strong logic to saying, hey, I didn't do it. It's not my fault. I'm not liable. And I think that Section 230 served a very good purpose back, you know, back 10, 15 years ago. Uh, but it doesn't. Ser I don't know if it serves the same purpose today. You know, this was when we had very small companies that were coming out of nowhere that you know, e pinions wouldn't, wouldn't have existed, but for Section 230. But you know, back then when you were working on a door that they had to saw a piece of it off. I love that story. You know, this is a, a shoestring operation that could have blown up into the next Google, and, and frankly, it did quite well for a long time. Um, you know, now the Section 230 beneficiaries. You know, I, I have bigger lobbying money than Hollywood. Uh, now the Section 230 beneficiaries are Google and Facebook and, and companies that really don't necessarily need our help. And it's, it's awfully nice to hear that they're willing to downgrade uh, mugshot sites. But you know, so we still have companies out there that say, we don't care. And then we have you know, Google, good luck getting them to also do this for revenge porn. It'd be nice, but I don't know how long you've been beating your head against that wall. Years. Okay, so you know, until your your skull cracks, uh, you could be doing that. And isn't it time? I mean, you know, uh, in the domain name registrar space, uh, domain name registrars are not liable for trademark infringements in domain name uh, registrations if they have a reasonable dispute resolution policy. And that reasonable has always meant using the UDRP. There's a default, and not a single domain name registrar is liable. Uh, you know, we have the DMCA system, which I agree with Eric, there have been massive abuses of it. Um, I think one of the problems with that is we don't have strong enough, I mean, there is 512G uh, or F, F. F. 512F. Um, it's unfortunately not strong enough. Maybe we need to strengthen that. Maybe we need to put in provisions for prevailing party fees. If you do have a, uh, if you do have a frivolous takedown, we need to put in damages for somebody who tries to take something down, you know, maybe a shadow anti-slap statute, since we can't seem to get that passed at the national level. I mean, there, there are cures, I think, that could both take care of the problem with these victims, whether it's the Katsouris family, whether it's the, you know, the, the victims of revenge porn, or people who will find their, their information on one of these so-called review sites, that could then foster free expression. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking from a perspective of, I'm a pretty much anything goes type person. If it's you know I've been quoted, if it's porn, if it's you know it's, it's consensual and it's adults, uh, other than that, I don't care. You know whatever two people in a consenting donkey want to do on camera is fine with me. Um, but if if it's you know if it if it is really that these you know these companies are the, I hate analogies in the internet space because they they always seem to fail. But if you have <coughs> you know let's say you had a store that had a wall on it that you just allowed anybody to spray paint anything they want on it and somebody puts something like, you know, puts up a you know, picture of Eric in a, you know, uh, well, with the donkey. I mean, you know, this, is, this would not be right or fair or representative of who he is. He's the oracle of Section 230, not the donkey fucker. Um, but everybody wants to come by and see this picture of Eric doing that. Now, is his, are his rights not being harmed? And frankly, everybody comes by, they want to come in and get a pack of smokes for afterwards. I'm making a lot of extra money off of attracting people to my business through this harmful content. That is really not fair. I didn't put it there. Should I be responsible for what some vandal spray paints on my building? No, probably not. But if Eric comes by and says, dude, that's not cool, and I say, section 230, well, you know, Eric ought to take a swing at me there, either physically or legally. And that's, you know, that's, that's what I feel, at least about Section 230 reform. There should be the person who's really benefiting from this immunity should also buy a little bit of responsibility that isn't just, if we feel like it, we'll get around to it. Eric, you want a, a last set of words on this beyond, um, yeah, beyond gonna, the specific I'll make example? A, I'll make a, yeah, I'll make a personal uh, request to Mark. Maybe you could retire that, um, uh, that analogy. I'm not sure about that one. Um, <laughs> um, you know, uh, I love Google. I use it every day. I use it multiple times an hour. 
Facebook, I love a little less. I still use it every day. Um, they are not the internet. And if we think of them and equate them as the internet, I think we're going to lead ourselves astray. I think about Pinterest as a better example. Um, Pinterest uh, came out of nowhere in a matter of a couple of years to become the fastest growing website of all time. In just the last couple of years, um, there is still innovation in the internet space. We have not determined the perpetual set of leading incumbents um, for uh, the internet. So what does a Pinterest need in order to grow as fast as it did? What are the inputs that it needs in order to be successful? Um, I also think about sites like Wikipedia or Craigslist, which both nowadays are, are financially stable enough to be able to, um, uh, uh, to protect their own interests. Uh, Craigslist offers 90x percent of its services for free to everyone, to the buyers and the sellers. They just provide it as a, quote, public service. Um, or Wikipedia is a nonprofit organization. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I'm not here to defend Wikipedia or Craigslist. I'm here to defend the companies that will replace them and the nonprofit organizations that will replace them. Uh, the uh, companies that provide 90x percent of their services for free replacing them. And all of those companies will also require the key inputs that will allow them to be competitive and to grow and not to be, uh, to, uh, be uh, kicked out of the industry by the overwhelming legal uh, uh, responsibility that can flow as we've seen in the copyright space. All right, fair place to leave that. Again, huge topic, incredibly important for the future of the internet, both the innovation piece, but also, you know, in some people's mind, the uh, let's control the bad stuff piece. It's not a debate that's going to go away anytime soon. So this is really bad stuff that we're talking about, right? I mean, ranging from really bad to just incredibly awful, horrible, and damaging. Why isn't criminal prosecution sort of the better answer, right? People do really bad things that hurt other people. We often think about the criminal justice system and law enforcement as the way to, to, to take care of it. And we've had a couple of examples just in the last few months of California indicting uh, operators of um, revenge porn sites. As Mark alluded to earlier, the, the US attorney in Los Angeles indicted um, uh, Hunter Moore, who had been the operator of the Is Anyone Up? Uh, dot com site uh, not too long ago as well. So what what about criminal prosecution as a tool, the tool for trying to deal with these issues? I think criminal prosecution is incredibly helpful. Um, it's normally based on state law, and if you think about the regulable states of privacy, there is observation, peeping tom laws, capture, video voyeurism law, and distribution. And it's this distribution part that often falls through the cracks of a lot of state criminal laws that focus on invasion of privacy. So there's a movement to sort of have each state have a criminal law that would also cover the non-consensual disclosure of the content that becomes used for revenge porn. Um, and the reason why that's helpful to, be, to have the criminal side is because um, when I have a plaintiff come in, he or she um, gets my hourly rate, and I can do a little bit of help with my hourly rate. I can, um, you know, I can send a, a letter to the perpetrator. We may, might be able to get a really tough settlement agreement early on, an assignment of copyright, and some other like pretty hardcore provisions in there. A great restraining order, um, and then I can help her take it down by using copyright tools to take down the photos, and then asking the search engines to recrawl so that that's updated. But at the end of the day, like he gets away with it on the civil side. Because even though I have litigated one of these cases, it wasn't revenge porn, but it was online defamation, to a default judgment, and we got a $1.2 million judgment, that's worth the paper it's written on. You know, It cost us $60,000 to do that. We got a $1.2 million judgment that we will never collect. So to say that there are <coughs> adequate remedies there, I think, is not true. And so what I always try to do is tee up a criminal case from the very start. And so since I see this in the same category of conduct as domestic abuse and violence and sexual harassment, I'm looking to family court to get a restraining order. Because some states do have criminal laws that cover non-consensual porn. If they do, use those laws. Or if the content was obtained illegally through hacking or extortion, use those laws. If it wasn't, go to family court, get a TRO, the perpetrator will continue to violate a TRO. But then you've got something that gives you injunctive relief. You can take, you can give it to websites and search engines and ask them to comply with the restraining order. 
And also, violation of a restraining order is at least a misdemeanor. And at that point, the perpetrator can just dig his own hole, depending on how much he wants to go beyond violating the restraining order. And so the only thing that scares these defendants is the threat of a restraining order or criminal penalties. And we know that civil deterrence has not been that effective because of the explosion in this industry. I mean, it's almost quaint to think back to what I was dealing with in 2009 before there were revenge porn websites. So there's like a nostalgia that was so easy. And I mean, now you look at it and there's been no deterrence. I'm not a fan of using yeah. the criminal law for this. Um, and we've, you know, we respectfully disagree on it. I mean, I, as much of a firebrand as I am against the practice, <clears throat> I guess I want to think back to, you know, look at, <clears throat> I look at a lot of the perpetrators of this, and yeah, they're idiots. Uh, a lot of them are adolescent idiots. Um, you know, I was, if I think about my own adolescent mistakes, and luckily they're all just broken bones and gunshot wounds and things like that that I still feel aches to this day. But, you know, uh, most of the, let's just look at the revenge element people here. You know, most of these are people who are dealing very poorly with a very strong emotional situation. And some, you know, dumbass 16-year-old girl posting naked pictures of her, of her ex-boyfriend on a site you know, should she wind up looking at criminal prosecution for that? And if we look at how child pornography laws, once we made an exception for that as a criminal uh, matter, look at how that has now come home to roost. And we have children, kids who are underage. Yes, the second they take that picture, they are child pornographers. Even if they might live in, uh, you know, there's some places where you can get married at 16. Two people get married. Take a picture of each other on their wedding night. That is now child pornography. Uh, there are you know, boyfriends and girlfriends. There was, there was a girl in Pennsylvania who's, who's facing prison time. There's kids in Florida that uh, my former partners represented who face a lifetime, who actually is spending a lifetime on the sex offender registry because he <coughs> sent out a picture of his girlfriend who was underage. I mean, I don't know if you know what that means in a place like Florida, but like in Miami, there is only one place a registered sex offender can live, and that is under the uh, Julia Tuttle Causeway Bridge. So there's a little camp of sex offenders that live there. I, you know, I want to be, I mean, I am all for using civil liability because it measures, uh, as I think Eric put it in a way I really liked, that it, it sort of, we vote on what, how much damage has been done and what it's going to cost and, and how we're going to remedy that. But the law is such a blunt, you know, criminal law is such a blunt instrument. It's either on or off. And once it's on, the weight of the state is upon you. And I, I just don't think that in the country that has the most people in prison per capita, uh, or maybe population-wise, I don't know how, how that statistic goes, but we have way too many people in prison as it is. Do we really want to put people in prison for this? Now, I understand how the victims feel. I, I hear them on the phone when they call me crying, saying, can you help me? And, uh, but you know, also getting prosecutors to care, just as a practical <laughs> element, getting a prosecutor to care, I mean, it, if, if it's, you know, you call them up and say there's like five underage kids drinking down the street, they'll send in a SWAT team. But, <clears throat> you know, you've got, if I called up a prosecutor and said, yeah, I got this 35-year-old uh, woman here, who, uh, her ex-husband's posting naked pictures of, the, of her on the internet, um, I'm going to run into like a, you know blue line of bros that aren't really going to care. Uh, even when I can get a, a you know prosecutor on the line, I mean I've I've got friends that I went to law school with who are in the cyber crimes divisions of various U.S. attorneys offices, and I tried to get them to care about my underage victims. So look, I'm not going to come to you just with somebody who's naked on the internet. I've got child pornography here. And it's like, well, what's she doing in the picture? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, it, and it's not that they're assholes. I mean, they just, they, they've got, how many people can they go after? Okay, you know, that, that's just not enough of a, of a priority. And I can respect that because, you know, the first one I did for an underage victim, I contacted an FBI agent that I, I have some contact with, and I said, look, I want to make sure that this is all done right and that we've got the photos documented because... You know, I don't know if you know this, but I, I can't even possess them as her lawyer. In fact, if I were defending a criminal case, you can't even possess the images as, the, as part of the criminal defense. 
I, and, I, and I said, and by the way, please do not, you know, this, this victim is 17 years and 10 months old in the pictures, you know, please do not devote your resources to this because I'm sure there's some eight-year-old chained up in a basement that would much rather you not spend five minutes away from her case. And, you know, and, and when, I, when you put all that into the mix, I'm, I'm just really uncomfortable with using it. I think it'll wind up being used very selectively, uh, very minimally, and then uh, very devastatingly when, you know, I think we could, we could put a little bit of upstream pressure and get the same thing done. And remember, we put that guy in jail. Guy does this, we put him in jail. That doesn't make the pictures go away. You know, it just puts the guy in jail. And will that deter the next person? Yeah, it'll deter some people, but the guy that finds the phone in the bar uh, that somebody left on a, on a stool uh, at the end of the night and says, uh, I've got, a, I got all these pictures, uses that very phone to upload them, you're not ever gonna catch him. Um, you know, and the, and the, the crafty ex-boyfriend, you aren't ever gonna catch him because, I mean, I can think of how I'd get away with it if I were to do it, you know, I'll just, I'll throw my phone down the subway platform and say, I don't know, my phone went missing. I, I didn't mean for that to happen. They're end of prosecution. Um, I mean, I, I think it's a noble effort. It, it, it certainly, I, I respect it deeply because it's trying to cause this bad thing to stop, but uh, the, the, the instrument scares the living daylights out of me. Eric, do you have a general reaction to the use of criminal women here? I would love to hear your response. Um, yeah, again, I go start with the idea. We've got uh, a principal bad actor, the uploader, and then we've got everyone else around them. Uh, with respect to the uploader, um, whether they should be covered by criminal law or not is, I think, probably the wrong question. There are so many overlapping crimes today that would likely cover most uploaders um, that they simply are, a, it's a, the prosecutions are simply a function of prosecutorial discretion, um, whether prosecutors are going to choose to intervene on any particular case, especially where there's the true <clears throat> revenge element to it, where someone is deliberately trying to cause emotional distress or to hurt the, the life prospects of another person. We got crimes out the wazoo in those circumstances. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, there's a wide range of menu options for prosecutors. Having said that, even then, um, there, we still want to be thoughtful. Is criminal law the right solution? And I think about the uh, sexting by Anthony Weiner, the, at the time, for, candidate for New York mayor. So he is a politician who is a recidivist sexter. Um, and the uh, recipient of his sexting messages uh, shared the uh, images that he sent to her. She was disseminating uh, um, uh, involuntary pornography, non-consensual pornography. Um, she was going outside the scope of the relationship to share it with the public at large. Had she not done that, on all likelihood, we would have simply refused to believe her. We said, this is a crackpot who's coming out and saying, Anthony Weiner is a recidivist. Um, but she had the evidence to prove her case in the, in the court of popular opinion. The only possible way, I think, she would have been able to share that. Under many of the kinds of crimes that we've discussed, and certainly under any new crimes that we might consider, that's a situation that we have to be thoughtful about. You might say, we don't need that particular piece of evidence in order to, um, uh, to uh, evaluate the legitimacy of Anthony Weiner's uh, mayoral campaign. He had plenty of other reasons why he shot himself in the foot or whatever. Um, but, uh, but I will simply point out, it, you know, to the extent that you say, yeah, let's just throw those bad boys in jail, um, we should be thoughtful about the full range of scenarios we're talking about. And there may be scenarios where, in fact, we don't want to simply treat the uploader as a criminal. There may be other legitimate considerations. Treating anyone else as a criminal becomes highly problematic at that point. Um, when we talked about the consequences of a notice-based liability scheme, um, as we've seen in copyright law, the threat of criminal liability simply causes uh, anyone else in the chain to become overreactive. Um, they simply cannot tolerate the idea that their liberty is at stake for something else that they didn't actually control. And so, um, it, you know, in my mind, uh, the proper locus of any criminal discussion is at the uploader stage. It would need to be thoughtful in light of all the overlapping crimes that we have today and uh, making sure we have preserve, preserve enough room and then make sure that we don't try and extend it beyond uh, to anyone else because that will distort a lot of socially beneficial behavior.
Erica, last word on this sure. and one last piece. So exactly what Mark said, the people who do this are idiots, is why criminal remedies work. Criminal remedies work for idiots. If you have something to lose, <coughs> civil remedies work. Criminal remedy is for the low. So in the same way that um, for a long time we didn't treat domestic abuse as a crime. Well, you could say he's just an idiot. He just punched her. Like, what are you going to do? Send him to jail for that? Like, he's got to work. They're a family. It's just... Let's just overlook it, right? And so I feel the same way with, uh, then there's something that when the law steps in and leads, there's a shaming that like, okay, you know what? You can't punch your wife when you're angry with her. The law says that's wrong. And there are um, penalties that I care about. I don't want to be a criminal. And that, I think, is pretty effective deterrence, both the shaming and the signaling function that the law plays about what we're going to signal, what we're going to tolerate as a society. Um, I also want to talk about the government getting involved. They're, they're improving. Um, but first, I want to talk about the impact that this has on victims' lives. Because when you're, when you're talking about, do we want to criminalize this or not, you're asking, is this conduct that is so bad and harms society that society has a vested interest in criminalizing this conduct? Well, this, this is the harm. Um, victims are routinely threatened with sexual assault. They are stalked, harassed, they are fired from jobs, they're forced to change schools. Some victims have committed suicide. It destroys their intimate relationships as well as their educational and employment opportunities. That's like pretty intense. It's the most <coughs> catastrophic event that has happened in their lives to date. And you know, we criminalize lots of things. We criminalize theft, we criminalize ID theft, and that's easy because there's an exchange of money. Um, but this has a value too, and so I think that there's a strong argument that criminal remedies are appropriate. And I, I actually think that this would be, I'm surprised I haven't heard more intermediaries weighing in on the criminal remedies against perpetrators. Because to the extent that they can create the impression that there is a justice system that works between the plaintiff and the defendant on that level, then they actually don't have to get involved. The problem is that if there's nothing the plaintiff can do against the defendant, then people look to intermediaries because they're like the referee or the you know, playground teacher to try to take some action. Let's do one last quick thing because we've referred to it a bunch of times and then I want to save the last eight or 10 minutes for questions. Everything we've talked about up to now is sort of punishing the perpetrators, maybe trying to get intermediaries to do something. Mostly not about getting images taken down, and, and you've referred a couple of times, Erica, to using copyright as a tool to try to actually get the images removed as opposed to just punishing the person or the, the site that uploaded them. Can you say just a little bit about your efforts there? And then, Eric, I know you have strong views sure. the other way on so, how copyright should um, be. Revenge porn is a copyright issue because you have a photo and a video. Um, and so a lot of times my clients, the plaintiffs, <coughs> took the photo or the video because they're selfies. Um, and so we already own the copyright, in which case we can send a takedown notice to the website and then to Google letting them know that this content should be taken down at its source and that the index should be updated. If my client does not already own the copyright, we're usually in a position to get an assignment from the perpetrator, who is now in the picture. And through a written assignment, my client can then own the copyright. So copyright is a very effective tool because the intermediaries respond to it. It's the only thing where you don't get that FU Section 230 response. And so um, I use it. Eric, it's also got an international, uh, it, it works internationally as well. Uh, you won't, I mean, I don't think somebody in, you know, in a foreign country is going to be worried about getting prosecuted in the U.S., but uh, through treaty obligations, sometimes copyright is stronger, in, at least in the European countries that I've worked in. Again, there are a couple of different ways this can play out. One is with the selfie, where the victim owns the copyright in the first instance. It's very neat. The different situations when it's taken by the perpetrator, they own it, but you, in one way or another, either, either convince them to give you copyright or in some cases that Eric has written about courts will uh, actually order the transfer of the copyright in something as part of the court case. Eric, I know you have uh, yeah, you know, views the other way on I, this. I mean, Section 230 is such a bright line rule um, that um, we've seen a whole bunch of ways to figure out how to get around it. And um, so if you were to think about it as um, uh, 
uh, in um, an analogy sense, um, there's a hole in copyright that is available for plans to pursue. That's the uh, I'm sorry, the hole in Section 230 that um, plans are uh, eligible to pursue, and that's copyright. So we're seeing an enormous amount of pressure being put on the copyright exception <coughs> to Section 230 because, as, as Erica said, it is the thing that will get intermediaries' attention when all other uh, recourse has failed. Um, and uh, in a situation like the selfie situation, I don't even see that as a distortion of copyright law. That's pretty straightforward copyright law. When we have an assignment of copyright after it's been published, um, that is also a very uh, straightforward application of copyright law. But it is ripe for misuse. And we are seeing examples where plaintiffs are misusing the assignment of copyright as a way of scrubbing legitimate, truthful, non, uh, non you know, uh, 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 non-involuntary uh, uh, content from the internet. Um, so, for example, um, uh, the way let me try a different scenario on for you. Imagine the business is unhappy with a negative review that's been posted online. The business wants to scrub that review, not because it's untrue, but simply because it's harming their business. They want to, to staunch the bleeding of people choosing to go patronize their competitors or keeping their dollars. Um, so one way to attack that review is to go to threaten the author to say, author, I'm going to take your house. Author says, well, let's not do that. What's plan B? Plan B is just give me an assignment of copyright and we'll just settle everything. I'll be happy. You won't, you'll get to keep your house and we'll go our separate ways. At that point then, we now have Section 230 is, has been wiped away as a protection for that review and for any intermediary because then the author presents themselves to all, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, uh, the yeah, business, so, uh, you know, uh, while we might laud that approach in the revenge porn and voluntary porn context as a good solution to the problem, recognize that we will see other applications where it is not so legitimate. And that strikes me as a whole that we're going to have to address a, as a system wide, at a system wide level, or else um, uh, Section 230 effectually, effectively will become irrelevant. Final note one, one area in which that happened that you were heavily responsible for dealing with was doctors that were requiring patients when they first came in to sign mm -hmm. uh, something that would in advance assign the copyright in any review they might write to the doctor. So if there was any negative review, someone posted to the doctor, the doctor could just use copyright to have it taken down. You would think that's some weird law professor hypothetical on exam. <laughs> what if a right. business said to its customers, I will treat you and solve your, in this case, potentially life-threatening problems only if you give me the copyright in something that you haven't written to date. You'd say, that's just insane. <laughs> that was a dominant industry in the medical community for a couple of years. All right, questions? Thank you. All right, well, thank you. This has been a fascinating discussion. I really appreciate it. So um, a, lot, a lot of the discussion, uh, particularly Eric's discussion, has been about 230 generally. And I know there's um, the original debate um, was about what happens if we try to make intermediaries liable for defamation. And the problem with defamation, the argument goes, is you don't know when information is defamatory. And if you make inter intermediaries liable for it, they're going to end up taking down a bunch of speech that is quite useful. <coughs> and it's going to bring down the internet <laughs> and all these useful um, sites. But you guys are actually talking about something very, very narrow. And Erica laid it out at the beginning, right? It's non-consensual pornography. And you're talking about um, something that's called you know, sexual content about a person when that person hasn't consented to, to it being distributed. And I was originally, I was sort of taken aback when Mark said, well, we can't make it sexual because there's too much kind of repression of sexual stuff online. But it, and then he added, you know, if it's consensual, let it go. But this is non-consensual sexual contact, um, sexual content. And so the scenario is an intermediary has posted a picture of someone in a clearly sexually uh, revealing position, that person notifies the intermediary, so no, no liability or action until they're notified, and says, that's a picture of me and I can prove it, and I haven't given consent, and you're distributing it. And at that point, the idea is the intermediary has to act and take it down. <coughs> and in the completely analogous context, context of, that's a picture that, for which I own the copyright, the intermediary has to take it down. But the question we're asking is, why shouldn't the law also extend to this other context called, it's a picture of me, it's my sexual, um, it's, I'm in a sexual position, I'm sexually revealed, which we can define very clearly in the law, take it down. Um, and I haven't, I've, I've heard a lot about, well, we'll you know, we're worried about 
meaningful, important First Amendment contact, but I haven't heard why that shouldn't be the law. And um, and so what I want to ask Erica and Mark is, do you think there's hope for some kind of a statute, maybe at the state levels? I know New Jersey has a statute. Do you think there's hope for more of those propagating? Um, and if not, because I don't think we can ever expect Congress to do anything on 230, um, is the hope just that the courts will pull back on 230? So it's both sort of um, what's the most promising avenue um, for reform? Um, where should I start? Did we have a starting? Well, I was, I was going to suggest that <clears throat> you know, we take a look at right of publicity. Now, that there's a split on whether right of publicity uh, is outside or inside Section 230. In the Ninth Circuit, it's clearly outside. C.C. Bill says, you know, the, the statute says <coughs> intellectual property is not covered. The Ninth Circuit read the word federal into that phrase, which doesn't appear there, but it makes sense. I, I understand why they read that in there. It, it makes some sense that Congress wouldn't be doing that. But, you know, in a, uh, there was a case out of <coughs> the District of New Hampshire where somebody, uh, was Doe versus Friend Finder Networks, where uh, somebody put, uh, if any of you are familiar with Adult Friend Finder, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> uh, <coughs> somebody put um, a picture, a fake profile up of a woman on there, and she sued for a whole litany of, of uh, claims, and all but one of them was knocked out on Section 230, and that was the right of publicity <laughs> claim. If you're using somebody's image, whether it's sexual or not, even if it's just a, just a shot of their face, uh, if you're using that for a commercial purpose, well, you don't have a right to do that. And perhaps that is the avenue, but uh, that's only going to even theoretically work outside of the Ninth Circuit. Um, I, you know, that's, that's been my suggestion when I've talked to legislators outside of the Ninth Circuit is just make sure that your right of publicity statute makes it clear that it's an intellectual property right, because in places like New York, right of publicity is a privacy right, not, a, not an intellectual property right. If you style it after New Hampshire, then you've got at least something there where you can say, look, it's outside of Section 230. The site itself is probably not going to be you know, heavily liable, but at least liable enough that they might take it down. Uh, you know, that, that might be one avenue that, that is uh, maybe just a little easier to travel down. The other opening is with federal <coughs> criminal law. And um, there's been a, there's a federal law that's being drafted right now. I haven't read the text or anything. The trick with the federal criminal law is that you want to narrowly tailor it so that it goes after the perpetrators and ideally the revenge porn websites. And so the way you do that is uh, you add the criminal mens rea so that it's intentional and knowing. Um, and that sort of gives an out to the search engines. And what it means is that if you have this criminal law, um, Section 230 cannot be raised as a defense. Search engines have a zillion other defenses. They have like hundreds of criminal laws on the books and they know how to deal with those. But this means that revenge porn websites would not be able to raise the Section 230 defense. Yeah, so, so I wanted to clarify on that because we talked a little bit about, you know, things that we could do to perpetrators themselves and you guys seem to be convinced that there's an array of things that we can do against perpetrators. Um, so is the whole then, I mean, if we talk about CDA and the CDA applies so long as, you know, it's not, it's not papering over basically criminal, federal criminal offenses, right? So, I mean, is the disconnect that the things that we do against perpetrators, none of those are federal? Right. The criminal remedies against perpetrators have been state so far, but there is this federal law that targets perpetrators and maybe arguably revenge porn websites. There are federal crimes that are also applicable to someone who is a perpetrator of a non-consensual pornography distribution. So that's also available. I don't, I can't think out of my head of a time when I've seen a federal criminal prosecution, yeah. but it would, there are federal laws that also would overlap um, with the perpetrators. So, so to be clear, are the two fixes, one, to create a federal criminal offense for this kind of behavior, or two, to amend the CDA to include civil offenses? Um, I think you'll see, I think there's three things. There's what Mark and Eric were talking about, about tweaking Section 230. That's very controversial, and I don't know which direction that would go in. So then there's playing the holes of Section 230. 
which is um, expanding, pushing at the boundaries of copyright law, like in the Garcia v. Google case, or you'll probably see a number of new federal criminal laws in the next, in the coming years. And I think that those are sort of the ways to poke at um, Section 230 and the broad immunity that it grants. Uh, I mean, so it, I'm not sure I fully understood your question, but part of it is, Though there might be an exception for federal crimes, they, that exception only applies if it's a criminal prosecution, not a civil claim based on the criminal uh, the criminal law. Um, and so, and all these federal crimes will be subject to defenses like the First Amendment. So right. it's easy to say, let's just hold everyone accountable for everything, and there will be constitutional limits to an approach like that. Right. All right, we are out of time. Apologies for that, but we don't want to stand in the way of you and lunch. Join me in thanking this amazing panel. I'm glad you can make it. All right, so um, lunch is set out right outside this room, so feel free to grab your lunches. And you're welcome to eat in here, or you're welcome to go downstairs to um, the tables with the umbrellas um, where you came, first came in. Uh, and um, we're going to try to come photo. back, and yeah. we'll start the next panel at 2 so that we can stay on schedule. It is crazy all right, thank you all so much. I'm not too fall to do that, but uh, <laughs> that's been my plan.